James Wilson, Pennsylvania. The government ought to possess not only first the force, but secondly, the mind or sense of the people at large. June 6, James Wilson, Pennsylvania. James Madison, Virginia. Were we not thence admonished to enlarge the sphere as far as the nature of the government would admit? This was the only defense against the inconveniences of democracy, consistent with a democratic form of government. All civilized societies would be divided into different sects, factions, and interests. In all cases where a majority are united by a common interest or passion, the rights of the minority are in danger. June 6th, James Madison, Virginia. Richard Patterson, New Jersey. Let them unite if they please, but let them remember that they have no authority to compel others to unite. New Jersey will never confederate on the plan before the committee. She would be swallowed up. He had rather submit to a monarch, to a despot, than to such a fate. June 9, Richard Patterson, New Jersey. John Dickinson, Delaware. Mr. Madison, you see the consequence of pushing things too far? Some of the members from the small states wish for two branches in the general legislature and are friends to a good national government, but we would sooner submit to a foreign power than submit to be deprived of an equality of suffrage in both branches of the legislature, and thereby be thrown under the domination of the large states. June 15, John Dickinson, Delaware. William Samuel Johnson of Connecticut, while implying Alexander Hamilton, who had a minor partially present role in the convention. While the centralized Virginia plan and the New Jersey plan favoring smaller states had both been proposed, Johnson then stated, A gentleman from New York, with boldness and decision, proposed a system totally different from both, and though he has been praised by everybody, he has been supported by none. June 21st, William Samuel Johnson. William Davy, North Carolina. We move slowly in our business. It is indeed a work of great delicacy and difficulty, impeded at every step by jealousies and jarring interests. A letter from William Davy to Richard Carswell on June 19th. Gunning Bedford, Delaware. The lesser states, gentlemen, do not trust you. If you possess the power, the abuse of it could not be checked. And what then would prevent you from exercising it to our destruction? The larger states, you say, all differ in productions and commerce, and experience shows that instead of combinations, they would be rivals and counteract one another. This, I repeat, is language calculated only to amuse us. June 30th. Gunning Bedford, Delaware. Oliver Ellsworth of Connecticut regards Luther Martin of Maryland. The day you took your seat must be long remembered by those present, nor will it be possible for you to forget the astonishment your behavior almost instantaneously produced when, without requesting information or to be led into the reasons of the adoption of what you might not approve, you opened against them. In a speech which held during two days, and which might have continued two months but for those marks of fatigue and disgust you saw strongly expressed on whichever side of the house you turned your eyes. Oliver Ellsworth of Connecticut to Luther Martin in a letter dated February 29, 1788. Benjamin Franklin, Pennsylvania. I have lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We have been assured, sir, in the sacred writings that 
except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. I firmly believe this. And I also believe that without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of Babel. We shall be divided by our partial local interests, our projects will be confounded, and we ourselves shall become a reproach and byword down to future ages. June 28th, Benjamin Franklin of Pennsylvania. Abraham Baldwin of Georgia. Abraham Baldwin's comment, so many things had been so well settled, might refer to the profoundly important vote that Baldwin cast that day, July 2nd, an abstention resulting in a deadlocked 5 to 5 vote and thus stopping a measure that favored the larger state's goals for their representation to such an extent that the departure from the convention of the smaller states suddenly became a real possibility. Baldwin's vote cooled the debate and a committee was formed to continue studying the impasse and find compromises, which they eventually did. Elbridge Gary, Massachusetts. If no compromise should take place, what will be the consequence? A secession would take place, two different plans will be proposed, and the result no man could foresee. If we do not come to some agreement among ourselves, some foreign sword will probably do the work for us. July 5th, Elbridge Gary, Massachusetts. George Washington, Virginia, and President of the Convention, when I refer you to the state of the councils which prevailed at the period you left this city, and add that they are now, if possible, in a worse train than ever, you will find but little ground on which the hope of a good establishment can be formed. In a word, I almost despair of seeing a favorable issue to the proceedings of the convention, and do therefore repent having had any agency in the business. July 10th, George Washington to Alexander Hamilton. Rufus King, Massachusetts. Considerations induced the convention to agree that direct taxes should be apportioned among the states according to the whole number of free persons and three-fifths of the slaves which they might respectively contain. Thus, while 35,000 free persons are requisite to elect one representative in a state where slavery is prohibited, only 25,559 free persons in Virginia may and do elect a representative so that five free persons in Virginia have as much power in the choice of representatives to Congress as seven free persons in any of the states in which slavery does not exist. This inequality in the appointment of representatives was not misunderstood at the adoption of the convention. The effect of this concession has been obvious in the preponderance which it has given to the slaveholding states over the other states. The concession was at the time believed to be a great one and has proved to have been the greatest which was made to secure the adoption of the Constitution. March 1819 in a speech in the Senate by Senator King. Governor Morris, Pennsylvania, upon what principle is it that the slaves shall be computed in the representation? Are they men? Then make them citizens and let them vote. Are they property? Why then is no other property included? The houses in this city, Philadelphia, are worth more than all the wretched slaves which cover the rice swamps of South Carolina. The admission of slaves into the representation, when fairly explained, comes to this, that the inhabitant of Georgia and South Carolina who goes to the coast of Africa 
and in defiance of the most sacred laws of humanity, tears away his fellow creatures from their dearest connections, and damns them to the most cruel bondages, shall have more votes in a government instituted for protection of the rights of mankind than the citizen of Pennsylvania or New Jersey who views with laudable horror so nefarious a practice. August 8th, Governor Morris, Pennsylvania. David Brierley, New Jersey. I hoped after the committee reported that we should have been able to have published by the 1st of September. At present, I have no prospect of our getting through before the latter end of that month. Every article is again argued over with as much earnestness and obstinacy as before it was committed. We have lately made a rule to meet at 10 and sit till 4, which is punctually complied with. Cannot you come down and assist us? David Brierley, August 21st, letter to William Patterson. John Rutledge, South Carolina. Religion and humanity have nothing to do with this question of slavery. Interest alone is the governing principle with nations. The true question at present is whether the southern states shall or shall not be parties to the Union. If the northern states consult their interest, they will not oppose the increase of slaves which will increase the commodities of which they will become the carriers. August 21st, John Rutledge, South Carolina. Roger Sherman, Connecticut. I am for leaving the clause as it stands. I disapprove of the slave trade, yet as the states were now possessed of the right to import slaves, as the public good did not require it to be taken from them, and as it was expedient to have as few objections as possible to the proposed scheme of government, I think it best to leave the matter as we find it. The abolition of slavery seems to be going on in the United States. August 22nd, Roger Sherman, Connecticut. George Mason, Virginia. The present question concerns not the importing states alone, but the whole Union. Maryland and Virginia have already prohibited the importation of slaves expressly. North Carolina had done the same in substance. All this would be in vain if South Carolina and Georgia be at liberty to import. The Western people are already calling out for slaves for their new lands and will fill that country with slaves if they can be got through South Carolina and Georgia. Slavery discourages arts and manufactures. Every master of slaves is born a petty tyrant. They bring a judgment of heaven on a country. August 22nd, George Mason, Virginia. Oliver Ellsworth, Connecticut. Let us not intermeddle. As population increases, poor laborers will be so plenty as to render slaves useless. Slavery in time will not be a speck in our country. Steps are already made in Connecticut for abolishing it, and the abolition has already taken place in Massachusetts. As to the danger of insurrections from foreign influence, that will become a motive to kind treatment of the slaves. August 22nd, Oliver Ellsworth, Connecticut. Charles Pinckney, South Carolina. If slavery be wrong, it is justified by the example of all the world. I cite the case of Greece, Rome, and other ancient states. The sanction given by France, England, Holland, and other modern states. In all ages, one half of mankind have been slaves. If the southern states were to let alone, they will probably of themselves stop importations. I would, myself, as a citizen of South Carolina, vote for it. August 22nd, Charles Pinckney, 
South Carolina. William Samuel Johnson, Connecticut. The other states have a right to redress. They have a right by the law of nature, and nations insist upon and compel a performance. How shall this be done? There is no other way but by force of arms. The convention saw this imperfection in attempting to legislate for states in their political capacity. The Constitution vests in the general legislature a power to make laws in matters of national concern, to appoint judges to decide upon these laws, and to appoint officers to carry them into execution. This excludes the idea of an armed force. The power which is to enforce these laws is to be a legal power vested in proper magistrates. The force which is to be employed is the energy of law, and this force is to operate only upon individuals who fail in their duty to their country. This is the peculiar glory of the Constitution, that it depends upon the mild and equal energy of the magistracy for the execution of the laws. William Samuel Johnson, Connecticut, January 4, 1788. Hugh Williamson, North Carolina. In the course of four months' severe and painful application and anxiety, the Convention have prepared a plan of government for the United States of America which we hope will obviate the defects of the present Federal Union and procure the enlarged purposes which it was intended to effect. You will observe that the representation of the second branch of the National Legislature is to be according to numbers, that is to say, according to the whole number of white inhabitants added to three-fifths of the blacks. We had many things to hope from a national government, and the chief thing we had to fear from such a government was the risk of unequal or heavy taxation. But we hope you will believe, as we do, that the southern states in general, and North Carolina in particular, are well secured. For example, 50 citizens of North Carolina can be taxed no more for all their lands than 50 citizens in one of the eastern states. This must be greatly in our favor, for as most of their farms are small, and many of them live in towns, we certainly have, one with another, land of twice the value that they possess. When it is also considered that five Negroes are only to be charged the same poll tax as three whites, the advantage must be considerably increased under the proposed form of government. The southern states have also a much better security for the return of slaves who might endeavor to escape than they had under the original confederation. It is expected that the considerable share of the national taxes will be collected by imposts, duties, and excises, but you will find that all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. A Navigation Act, or the power to regulate commerce in the hands of the national government, by which American ships and seamen may be fully employed, is the desirable weight that is thrown into the northern scale. That is what the southern states have given in exchange for the advantages we mentioned above. The North Carolina delegates to Governor Caswell, September 18, 1787. Edmund Randolph, Virginia. Concerned with laws by states that impair private contracts, Randolph favored an amendment limiting such interferences this provision is an essential one because it must be promotive of virtue and justice and preventive of injustice and fraud. If we take a review of the calamities which have befallen our reputation as a people, we shall find they have been produced by frequent interferences. If you inspect the great cornerstone of republicanism, you will find it to be justice and honor. 
Randolph speaking at the Virginia Ratifying Convention, June 1788. Charles Cotesworth Pinckney, South Carolina. It is the true interest of the southern states to have no regulation of commerce. But, considering the loss brought on the commerce of the eastern states by the revolution, their liberal conduct towards the views of South Carolina, and the interest the weak southern states had in being united with the strong eastern states, I think it proper that no fetters should be imposed on the power of making commercial regulations, and that my constituents, so prejudiced against the eastern states, would be reconciled to this liberality. I had myself prejudices against the eastern states before I came here, but would acknowledge that I have found them as liberal and candid as any men whatever. August 29th, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, South Carolina. Nathaniel Gorham, Massachusetts. If the government is to be so fettered that it is unable to relieve the eastern states, what motive can they have to join in it, and thereby tie their own hands from measures which they could otherwise take for themselves? The eastern states were not led to strengthen the Union by fear for their own safety. I deprecate the consequences of disunion, but if it should take place, it was the southern part of the continent that had the most reason to dread them. August 29th, Nathaniel Gorham, Massachusetts. Pierce Butler, South Carolina. Mr. Butler, to move after Article 15, if any person bound to service or labor in any of the United States shall escape into another state, he or she shall not be discharged from such service or labor in consequence of any regulations subsisting in the state to which they escape, but shall be delivered up to the person justly claiming their service or labor which was agreed to by the convention, August 29th. Pierce Butler, South Carolina.